And this week, the agenda thought about two days in June, parsed new prescriptions for health care issues and visited new homes and new lands. But the agenda's week in review tonight begins with oil's slippery slump. Plummeting oil prices has meant, and look at those lines, that basically reflects what's been going on uh, since uh, the middle part of last year. Brent crude, Western Texas Intermediate, and Western Canada Select all going down, down, down. And what's that done to the value of the Canadian dollar? Well, close to par back in June. In December, down again. And most recently, down again. So, again, as we look at the big picture here, we figure all this out. Is this a zero-sum game? in as much as if it's bad for Alberta, it's good for Ontario. Yes? Uh, well, there's certainly an offset there. Uh, and the Premier spoke to that, that uh, she said that the uh, Ontario's economy can act as a buffer. Uh, the conventional wisdom is that it hurts Alberta and Newfoundland more than it helps us. But a recent RBC report uh, tried to make the opposing argument that, in fact, again, due to the lower Canadian dollar and the fact that Michigan and Ohio and New York states, which are big, big sources for of, uh, Ontario's exports, is where our, our stuff goes, because those economies are going to do so much better with lower oil prices that, in fact, Ontario's gain will be larger uh, than and the, the offset from other places. So it really depends who you ask. But on a basic level, there is that offset there that uh, Alberta's down and Ontario's up. That's, uh, Ellen, let's follow up on that because uh, we need to have a better understanding, I think. Not that you didn't give us a good, you gave us a lovely understanding. But let's, let's keep analyzing whether or not Alberta's loss is compensated for or more than compensated for by potential gains in Ontario. How does it look to you? Well, I think part of that may depend how long this price route continues because that will help to determine to what degree um, energy producers pull back on expansion and investment. And that's going to be a key determinant of how this plays out in the Canadian economy. Um, What's and that's, the timeline on that? Well, I, I think that's the part we don't know, yeah. and that's what we were saying about you know 2015 into 2016. So if prices remain this low for a very long time, like over the next year or into 2016, what we've seen so far in Canada is we've seen some... Um, energy producers, some oil producers, predominantly not so much in the oil sands, but more conventional producers, pulling back on expansion. Hmm. Um, if we continue to see more energy producers pulling back and more um, investment delayed, including things such as LNG, which is linked to the price of Liquefied oil. natural gas. Right, in BC. If we see those major investments put off, that would have a significant impact, not just on the regions of the country like BC and Alberta, where those investments take place, but also across the country because the labor force um, and other kinds of manufacturing spin-offs take place in other in other provinces as well. But does that matter to the government of Canada if they get less revenue from oil but more revenue from manufacturing in Ontario? They're not going to be able to replace the lost oil revenue with with money from Ontario. It's not going to be strong enough. In fact, uh, uh, they're going to be looking at significant budget problems if this price situation continues How much longer. How big a hold do you think? Well, it's going to be a lot bigger. I, ha I don't have numbers on it. Uh, I don't Five think anybody billion, does. Uh, it could be. I mean, uh, we're, they've already lost billions. Alberta is certainly in a huge hole because of this already. Uh, the, other thing, the other thing that the federal government has to deal with is that, that it'll have less money for transfer payments. It'll have less money for social programs. It'll have tougher time balancing the budget, which they promised to do. Mm -hmm. All those things become more difficult. The national unemployment rate will go up because more people in that sector will lose their jobs than will ever gain it in manufacturing. We're not going to see a huge surge in manufacturing investment. That era is over. You'd have to have the dollar down very low for a very long period before multinational companies say, oh, let's build another car plant in Ontario. That's not going to happen. What you'll see is, is an increase in manufacturing output that's already there, but there's very little slack in manufacturing because so much production has already been lost. They're not going to be able to make that up. And the tax revenues that the federal government gets from Newfoundland for the offshore stuff, which will shut down fast because they need about 100 bucks a barrel to make any money, uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan, all that revenue is going to be declining precipitously. Sounds, in a way, Elena, like we should be cheering for higher oil prices. 
It's bad for Canada as a whole if they go down too far. Is but we right? also have to look at what else, what else happens globally um, and what the impact would be. And I think the other risk that some people talk about is that, and, and you might, might be able to explain this better, but um, if you have a quick correction, so at a certain point, if producers start to pull back very, very quickly, you could actually have a, a, a whiplash. I believe this has happened in the past where um, the supply comes off very, very suddenly and the reverse trend takes over and prices spike and that becomes a shock globally. You want to add to um, that? Well, absolutely. You would. Uh, you have seen this in the past and uh, we would not want to see this again where we have sort of a 1970s style uh, oil price spike that would slow down a U.S. economy that finally seems to be uh, getting on its feet. So yes, we would certainly like to avoid that. If we've lost, and I think the number's 250, 300,000 manufacturing jobs in the province of Ontario over the past decade, will this combination of cheaper oil and a less dear dollar, how many of those jobs do you think we could get back? I don't think we're getting a lot of them back. I think what this is more going to do is sort of stem the bleeding as far as employment goes. Because companies had to do one of two things to survive, that either they, they died or went to the U.S. or Mexico or someplace else because they simply couldn't compete. Or they realized that they were going to be have to be less labor intensive, really automate uh, their production, you know, go really high tech. The problem is once you do that, you don't really need more people after that, uh, that point. So we're going to see a number of manufacturing companies do well, but they're not particularly labor intensive. Hmm. So the people that they'll be hiring is not line workers or people like that, but they'll be in marketing and sales and regulatory compliance. And there's not a ton of jobs there. When I was a kid, I think uh, Roland Michener was the Governor General, and he decided that uh, participation and physical health for the country was going to be the thing that he wanted to focus on. He was going to champion that. And I just want to take, before we get to the specifics of, of your talk this year, I just wonder how and why you decided that citizenship was going to be it for you. I think the most important thing is that people feel when they have citizenship, because it's one of the most important things about the organization of states now and of nations is to have citizenship. It is the thing that when we think about Canadian citizenship, we know that it is probably the most valued citizenship in the world. People think it's a treasure. And those of us who have been citizens for a long time, or those of us who have been born here or have been citizens for generations, kind of know it, but we don't appreciate what it means when you've come here from someplace else, and after five years, six years, you become a citizen. You become fully part of what Canadian life is. And you become part of a country where they don't impose on you what a citizen must be. We have the idea of what you can be and what you can offer, and that is what has made our citizenship. And it's a unique kind of citizenship in the world, very unique. Unique, but interesting that you say it's the best one in the world. And, and of course, the assumption is the American citizenship, the American passport is the best thing in the whole world to have. You don't think so? No, I don't think so. When I look at Ferguson, Missouri, I don't think so. Hmm. I think they have so many unresolved problems in the United States having to do with racism, particularly and not to do with multiculturalism, because we have multiculturalism, they have ra racism. Hmm. Uh, there's an unresolved problem in the United States that's written right into the contradiction of their, uh, of their Declaration of Independence, um, in which they talk about all the ideals of the Enlightenment, we the free, etc. And these men who wrote that and who signed it and who were brilliant intellects, people like Jefferson and so on, had slaves and mm. they were able to sign their names to this document. Who did they mean? And they called, you know, a slave, a, a black person, was only two-thirds of a human being in terms of the Electoral College. So you have these inherent contradictions in a place like the United States. I prefer Canada, where we, didn't, we don't have that. What we have really is a country which has, is very strongly based in a British tradition of the Magna Carta, which was, you know, nearly a thousand years ago now. Mm and of the freedoms established there that was revamped in the revolution of 1660 so that parliamentary democracy came to the fore and constitutional monarchy was anchored. And then we were able to develop all our rights and freedoms till we have you know, one, a wonderful charter of rights and freedoms and a parliamentary democracy and common law and civil law and are able to bring those things together 
and we bring a very we have a very complex kind of citizenship but when people come here and they learn about it and they take part in it they realize the advantages that we have in Canada that nobody else has well advantages yes but nevertheless you talk about in your subtitle the paradox of our citizenship what are you referring to there well I think the paradox really is that people come here and they have they bring a lot of things with them um, we have people coming from about 109 different countries to Canada at any given citizenship ceremony and I see this through my Institute for Canadian Citizenship because we do these ceremonies there are 49 people say uh, getting citizenship they come from 28 different countries mm -hmm. and you know that yourself when you ride the subway you see them you see this development this morning I was walking along uh, towards Huron Public School because I'm meeting somebody at nine o'clock for coffee and the children coming towards the school you didn't know what country you were in because you saw them all races all colors and different different feelings there's no other country in the world that has that so that's how you knew you were in Canada that's how I know I'm in Canada and when I look around a subway car or a bus I can see that I'm in Canada because if I close my eyes I hear everybody speaking in vaguely Canadian accents I open hmm. them and I don't know where they're from and I think that's wonderful and we're used to that we're used to the fact that we see that diversity all around us. No other country is like that in the world. Well, we're used to that in urban Canada. Are they used to that in rural Canada? Well, you'd be surprised because in places like Red Deer, um, uh, Alberta, and smaller towns in Saskatchewan, they are getting to be used to it because they have jobs there. Hmm. And so they're attracting, uh, they're attracting landed immigrants and people from other countries. And they, in the case of Saskatchewan, actively advertised for them. You know, in the subway there were ads about three or four years ago saying, come to Saskatchewan if you're a new immigrant. We want you. We have jobs, etc. And I think that's what you're going to be seeing. And I think that that's why uh, when we say to ourselves, uh, the Canada that, that we knew when we were growing up, and you know, I have a nostalgia for that. I grew up in a very white bread, white Canada with white snow and sometimes Which you did well by. I did very well by because I was kind of a novelty and uh, being a novelty there was no there was no prejudice against me even though we were in the Chinese head tax registry as I learned when I did research for my for my book uh, nobody ever took any action about that we never paid the tax we never we were never approached about it and I wouldn't have known about it had a PhD student not sent me the page in the <laughs> ledger uh, because Canada in its own way um, is suffers from, I, uh, not suffers from, but basically has a kind of attitude of benevolent neglect. <laughs> and that benevolence is really wonderful because it basically, the decency of Canadian people, and they are extraordinarily decent people. There's something called cell slider that I think we need to know about for some background purposes here. So tell us what that is. Um, yeah, so Cell Slider was our first uh, product that we developed. Um, and we launched that uh, just over two years ago, so in October 2012. And so if you rewind about a year before that, um, that was when we really started off our sort of exploration of citizen science. Um, because we knew that our scientists had huge amounts of um, data that they needed to analyze um, and that a lot of that analysis had to be done by the human eye. And so it was going to take them years and years to get through it or the analysis just wouldn't get done. Now, at the same time, we knew that crowdsourcing was really growing um, as a concept. Um, and we've particularly seen how it had been used um, in the astronomy space uh, to analyze data um, that they were having to get through. Um, and so we sort of thought to ourselves, well, what if we could get the eyes of the general public onto our data um, and get the general public to help analyze this cancer data um, and so release those bottlenecks, speed up the research and really help us to beat cancer sooner. And Cell Slider was the first product that we produced. It's a simple web-based app um, and um, what you're basically doing is we've taken the job that the pathologists would do and we've made that accessible to the general public. So we've made it quite simple. It's, um, it's almost like a game of um, Snap. Um, and people go on and they answer some simple questions um, and help us to analyze um, ca real cancer cells. So you've crowdsourced, in effect, this kind of cancer research. What made you think anybody would be interested in helping you out on this? Well, I suppose we'd seen it work in the astronomy space. Um, and so we knew that in other areas of science, um, the general public were willing to get involved um, 
in helping with real science. Um, so it, it was a test for us to see if they would help with cancer. Um, but um, we also knew that we have a huge number of people um, who support us, who want to volunteer with us. Um, and this was something really exciting, which really enabled them to get directly involved in our science. Um, and that's proven to be something that the public are really, really keen to do. Any idea how many people actually participated? Um, we've had about half a million people in total get involved um, across all of our apps that we've launched. Incredible. Okay. Now, when you made the decision to move from a web-based project to a cell phone platform with a couple of other apps, I think Genes in Space is one and Reverse the Odds is another, uh, why did you think that was the way to go? I suppose we'd seen the success of Cell Slider. Um, we, um, we, we saw how popular it was with the general public, um, and we saw that in the first three months, they were able to get through data that our researchers had taken 18 months to get through, and that they could do it to a comparable lab level of accuracy. So that was really, really exciting. Um, but at the same time, we'd seen the success of mobile games um, and we'd seen the, the number of hours that people were playing, um, for example, Angry Birds each day. And so we thought to ourselves, well, what if we could just take one tiny percentage of that market, um, if we could tap into that so that when people were playing mobile games, they were also doing cancer analysis at the same time, then that would be absolutely incredible. And and the market we could tap into would be so much bigger than we were able to do with Cell Slider. Jennifer, I want to ask you, uh, you got something called Pain Squad. Actually, you know what, let's look at the, we got some tape okay. on this. Let's look at Pain Squad first and then we'll come back and ask uh, some of the method behind the madness of that. Roll tape, please. We gave each recruit an Apple iPhone loaded with the Pain Squad mobile app. Then twice a day, an alert from headquarters told patients it was time to complete their pain reporting mission. Because the reports worked with iPhone's user-friendly touchscreen, kids could easily fill them out. With a simple flick of the finger, they could identify exactly where and how much it hurt, as well as which medications were working best. But making it easy was, well, the easy part. We knew to be truly successful, we needed to find a way to encourage our young target daily. So we called in some police reinforcements. Hey, rookie. Welcome to Pain Squad. It's really great you're here. We need all the help we can get to help put pain in its place. We brought together the cast of Canada's top police dramas, Flashpoint and Rookie Blue, and filmed a series of inspiring videos, then deployed them throughout the app. To encourage the kids to fill in their reports, we built in a graduation structure. When a recruit completed three reports in a row, they received a message from HQ informing them that they were moving up the ranks. You are now officially a full-fledged detective in Pain Squad. Well done. At this rate, you might even be the next chief. <laughs> How's it going? It's going great, actually. We launched uh, Pain Squad in the Apple Store in November, uh, and we've had over 600 downloads of it. Um, and we've just completed a study um, that looks at the um, reliability and validity of the tool in four centers in Canada, and kids are really enjoying it. Well, this was the key, right? <coughs> you, you, you have to ensure compliance, and yeah. I mean, I, we can see some of the, yeah. the sort of tricks of the trade that you used. Yeah. Compliance is okay? Yeah, so compliance is fabulous, actually. I previously had developed a similar electronic diary for young people with arthritis, and we had compliance in the 70s. And we were quite concerned about the compliance with young people with cancer, because these are people undergoing cancer treatment that makes them feel tired, experience pain, feel nauseated, so we were quite worried that the compliance actually wasn't going to be low. So for that reason, we actually came up with this theme of police squad and that used the concept of gamification, where as Hannah said, we built this sort of as a game where the kids could level up. The more reports they completed in terms of uncovering clues about their pain, they could move up the ranks from a rookie to the chief of police mm -hmm. and in our studies of over 120 kids using it we had almost 90 percent compliance with completing it twice a day for a two or three week period. And 90 percent is a pretty good number. 90 percent is fabulous. It's a fabulous number and these are people of what age generally who are using it? The app was developed for kids 8 to 18 years of age with cancer. You'd think every single thing about the JFK presidency has already been written and yet you have managed to find a new way to tell the story. Where, where'd you get the idea to sort of frame those two issues through that 48-hour period through that prism? Well, I had been looking for a way in. Um, I'd been thinking about JFK a long time, and I, I was looking for a way 
to say some things about JFK that maybe had not been said before. So would I write a biography? Well, we have lots of those, as you've just said, Steve. Would I write a reconstruction of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Bay of Pigs? Done. We've done that. Yeah. Would I write a book about JFK's relationship with somebody? Almost all done. Mm. Then I came across these two days, and I said to myself, I, I didn't approach it as two days. I just saw two great speeches in an administration in which rhetoric really mattered. And I said, my God, two interesting speeches, two consequential speeches, and then I began to find out all the stuff around them. So I said, is there a prospect of reconstructing 48 momentous hours? I don't say the most momentous because mm -hmm. someone's always going to say, well, the Cuban Missile Crisis is going to be more. Sure. But I thought perhaps if I could find a way to explore and animate these two days, it might be a way into understanding the president in a way that had not been approached before. JFK had 1,036 days in his presidency, as you tell us. So you focus on June 10 and 11. Because of the two speeches, that was the way in? That was the way in. The way in was that because rhetoric so mattered. But of course, as someone said to me, well, presidential rhetoric, it's dispensable. I mean, you know, you, it, it's, it, it, it dissipates. And so I said, but yes, but these two speeches were enormously consequential. One is about uh, 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 nuclear arms, and it leads to the first of the nuclear arms control treaties. The second is about civil rights, and it leads to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I once had on this program Theodore Sorensen, after he wrote his book, Counselor. Um, I guess, you know, we had a bit of an argument, actually, as to which was the greatest JFK speech of all time. And I said it had to be the inaugural address, because ask not, you know, what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. That had to be it. I was uh, advised that I was wrong. Teddy Sorensen's favorite speech is as follows. Roll tape. I think the best speech he ever gave was the commencement address at American University in Washington on June 10, 1963, which we call the peace speech, the strategy of peace. It was the first speech by an American president to re-examine the Cold War, to re-examine our relations with the Soviet Union, and to re-examine what we meant by peace itself. Substance is what makes a speech great not simply wording. You would be surprised how often that particular speech is quoted and when I tell audiences in Canada and the United States that it was Kennedy's best speech, I often see people nodding and many of them tell me they agree they have read that speech and quoted it over and over. So the peace speech over the inaugural for you too? Absolutely. How come? Well, the inaugural today looks belligerent, it looks a bit bellicose. It is all about foreign policy. That was understandable. There is no heed paid it really at all to civil rights. It is a beautiful piece of theater, as was Berlin, by the way. And Berlin in June of 63 follows these two speeches I look at. The inaugural is a magnificent call to, I won't say to call to arms, call to service. But it does look a little dated today, whereas the peace speech looks innovative and open and generous and modern. He said in that speech at American University, no nation in the history of battle ever suffered more than the Soviet Union suffered in the course of the Second World War. What was so particularly unusual? I mean, it's true, but, but what was so unusual about saying that at the time? Well, what's interesting about the, 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 the peace speech is how JFK approaches it. It is, by the way, written largely in secret. It's written carefully over six or seven weeks. He cuts out uh, um, the State Department, the Defense Department, the, those secretaries will not see this speech until the hours before. He cuts out the CIA, he cuts out the congressional leadership, all of whom might have been consulted on a major foreign policy address. Now, why was that so? Precisely because of what you've just said. He is going to humanize the Russians in a way a Cold War president had never done before. And let's just finally look at this a half a century later. Uh, put it into context. What ultimately did these two days mean to the Kennedy presidency? I think everything. I think the calendar says June of 63 was late spring. I think it was high summer. I think this is Kennedy's crowded hour in which for the first time in what is an uneven presidency with lots of defeats, I think he sees what the office is. I think he's courageous. I think he's assertive. 
He says, we can speak to the Russians differently. He's breaking with the rhetoric of the last 18 years. When Khrushchev hears that speech, he says, no American has talked to us that way since Franklin Roosevelt. And he does get the first of the arms control treaties. It will be limited. It is the limited test ban treaty. It will be limited, but it's a beginning. It will not end the Cold War as Kennedy would like it to. More substantially is the next day. The Civil Rights Act will be among the two or three seminal pieces of legislation. It will begin in Kennedy's White House. We can debate whether he himself would have got that through. Lyndon Johnson will push it through in 64. There's a difference among historians about when Kennedy, when or if he would have gotten it. But he sees the moment, <clears throat> sees and seizes the moment, and says, now's the time, and I'm going to do this without focus groups, without public opinion polls, because this is the right thing to do. How many presidents act that way today? And in two issues on two days, on the two biggest issues of his generation, he acts boldly and decisively and consequentially. And five and a half months later, he's dead. He's dead in Dallas. And that is The Agenda's Week in Review. And you can see all of those programs in their entirety on our website, theagenda.tvo.org, on our iTunes channel, and on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash theagenda. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.